The first one is a wonderful tribute to the genius of Bengal, Michael Masurundar. The second one showcases the mixed legacy of the British Raj, even by uh, portraying the wonderful attempt by women of Nainta to counter the hegemony of different kinds. And the last one is the tale of how the country grabbed with and uh, uh, tried to overcome the pandemic. It is very contemporary. I learned a lot uh, just by browsing a few pages and uh, I am sure this discussion will bring about more ideas. It won't take much of your time at all. And I just want to say I am glad to welcome all of you once again. Thank you all. <coughs> Welcome to this program. Thanks for accepting the Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rao and Dr. Rajmohan, and also Jyotiji for getting all this organized. So as we begin the conversation, I think first and foremost the curiosity about Namita's reaction when she heard that she received the Scientific Academy Award. I think we all want to know what was your feeling on uh, this occasion. And also, as you mentioned, there was a clash of dates, and you could not actually be personally present to receive this very prestigious award during the ceremony in Delhi. So your personal thoughts, your public thoughts, um, where does this book that won the Science Academy Award, Things to Leave Behind, feature in the corpus of your more than 20 books? Um, I cannot forget that day. It was a difficult time in all our lives. My mother was in hospital and struggling actually for her life. Um, she had COVID, she had had a knee transplant, her heart was giving up, her kidneys were giving trouble. In the middle of all this, I got this phone call from Rao Sahib. And in his usual soft-spoken way, he conveyed uh, that, uh, yes, this book had won the Scientific Academy Award for 2021. And I can tell you, Booker, Oscar, all these things on one side. For me, that was the moment. Because, because as you explained, I belong to the Indian languages. I write in English. And uh, I don't feel an imposter among Indian language writers because for me, the English I write is part of the Indian languages. I wish I had been more fluent in my mother tongue Hindi uh, as to be able to write in that. But sometimes uh, education, ability, circumstance, and it gives me great pleasure when one of my books is translated. Opportunity that awaited these young writers who so on. So I just am being grateful, mother, to be a part of this uh, organization which I have previously also been in different things. We have, we have always had to cooperate with the Jaipur Great Fest. I've been on the jury of one or two of the prizes in the past. And the fearless independence, the thoughtful application of mind, the total sense of duty and devotion of Mr. Rao and all his colleagues, all of you, I don't have to tell you, all of you know these things already, Mala, you know it, we all know it. To pick up the point about the multilingual and the multicultural aspects of uh, Indian literature, to which of course English and all other languages belong, if I were to look a little more deeply into your novel that won the award, Things to Leave Behind, there is a lot there of the local and the global. It's also history and it's fiction. And it deeply enters the lives of uh, the Kumani people right from 1856 to the early uh, decades of the, of, uh, the current century, of the last century. So uh, actually there is a lot of uh, musicality, folklore, imagination that goes in. And uh, Vani Bhakti is here. And uh, it might be lovely to hear Vani recite and sing something from Kumau. Can you give me one? Can you seize your mic? No, I'm going to get a person let me do it without it. Oh, wow. She doesn't want to. No, I didn't. No, no. No, no. She doesn't want to. I really, I'm going to get a person to let me be. No, that's it. This is a book which is very close to my heart. I am like a little a uh, figment of Kumau, big one is Namitaji. And this book brings a lot of memories of my mother, Dr. Uma Pantripati. And uh, what I'm going to read is probably one of the most beautiful excerpts of this absolutely extraordinary book. It's called Baramasa. First the sky, a pure, clear blue, with clouds, shaped like elephants and sheep and small birds circling the campus. Then, the low hills 
surrounding Pannatal in a green, grey green haze. The trees still and expectant, waiting for the breeze to ruffle them. The lake, somewhere blue, some, sometimes green. The waves blinking in the sunlight and sitting in the grass in the foreground. A part of the picture, as he been seen, I watch myself being studied by his observant eyes, by the intensity of the brush as he strokes the canvas. The brush strokes the canvas as his hand touches my skin, my pale skin, my wind blown hair. The absence of my being, my wanting self are all restored by his gaze. A dragonfly hovers in the rock by the lake. It's not looking at me. Come on, it's seeing its reflection in water. I'm a part of these fluttering wings, the translucent gaze of that flight. I can see myself in the grass of my naked skin. I have forgotten my clothes. <laughs> they lie beside me like a heap of heavy fabric. My body is like the earth. It's, it's, it's the mud. It's not the sound and the other spread out to listen to the wind, to let it carry. As an ant crawls up my leg and as a worm curl and delight in the dark mud, as a dragonfly dreams in the sun and the shadows of the afternoon announce the evening, I hear an answer to the Neoli from another hill. Somebody has picked up the cadence, hear the plea in a voice carried in the echo of the wind. A man's deep voice that catches the verse almost before the echo has reverberated and settled into the hills. Novel, Lamita. 
I, you know, I, I identified with it so much. It felt, you know, it was part of my history, what I had grown up with, what I had heard about. And, uh, you know, the beautiful way that you used all the folklore and the stories that we used to hear, the, you know, the law that used to go around and open them into this really compelling and powerful narrative. So, uh, I mean, I can go on and on about it and have so many questions. But, the first of all, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, books are written for a variety of reasons. And uh, when a book springs organically from a writer's heart, that, that kind of book is always very powerful and connects very deeply with the reader. So, you had mentioned that after reading Padrita uh, Pange's Kumau Katehas, you, uh, you, know, you began to think about the book. But uh, was there something more, some other, what was the really strong impetus that uh, drove you to write this book? You know, um, there are three parties sitting here in a row and uh, people from all over the world are attached to their hometowns, to their regions. There's nobody who doesn't, unless they harbor a violent hatred for that place, sometimes they have this love, affection, nostalgia. But we Pahadis are a breed apart. <laughs> and we really feel so bonded and linked uh, anywhere we go. I, I, and sometimes even when the families are a generation away from the mountain. So I grew up in Nenikal. My great-grandfather from my father's side had written Kumauka Itihas. His name was Badhita Pandey. But I feel that a lot of the material he had used, he had actually got from an extra ordinary set of books called the Himalayan Gazetteer by Matthewson. And I was fortunate enough to have access. Uh, there was a guest house in Ranikhet where I was staying with a friend of my father's who had a BSS, BSF library there and he is the one who first lent them to me and then I bought them and accessed them from various libraries and this is such a great archive of the folklore and the history of Kumar that a lot of thesis, a lot of people have used that material and uh, I sometimes authenticate with that material. So when I read all this, I just got a new idea of the mountains and their history. And you know, I belong to that generation which still knew the changes. I had seen the changes in my grandmother's life, in other people's life. I had recorded oral histories of Shivani Ji, of uh, uh, Hira Pandey's mother-in-law, known simply as Jia, of my own grandmother. Uh, and uh, these oral histories carried so much weight within them of the changes in the hills because these women remembered their own lives and the lives of a previous generation. I told them, please talk about your mothers and life in the house because life inside the household is very different. The history of men is written in wars and legislation and these big changes. But the small changes that truly impact society when they stop using a wood fire perhaps, when somebody starts wearing saris which was revolutionary in those days, small little things, they lead to the big changes. And because I had worked on this book of oral history, I understood those changes. I didn't have to research them. And, uh, I wanted to write this book because my uh, my husband was Maharashtra and my daughters are half party. One of them identifies completely with the hills, one doesn't so much. And uh, But I wanted my grandchildren and three grandchildren, I wanted my nieces, I wanted every person in the next generation in my family to remember how the hills have been. They have changed completely our hills. In Yubodha, you may not recognize many of the things from this book, or you may get the ruins of some of these old stories, old times. I wanted a record. That's why I did it. That somebody should, because I know only about 20 or 30 people who may carry these memories and be able to put them in their stories. Rinal has done a lot of it in Rinal Pandey. 
you know, Pandi has done a lot. You, Deepa, you've done so much of another strand of this one. And, you know, she, Deepa has recorded so many of the folk tales as well. So, Pushpesh Pant has done something. So, I just wanted it to be out there. So, when the new stories come out, as they are coming, as they will come, I wanted some roots with the old stories. Because, um, and that is what society Academy does. It gives us continuity in uh, linguistic memories. That is the story. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we'll come back to some of these points. But just as Navita, you wrote about Kumau as an insider from the personal archives and memories of people. Uh, the book that uh, comes out is betrayed by hope that you and I co-authored. Did you feel that writing about Michael Madhusudan that you were coming as an outsider or was there an insider angle there also? Because I do recall that the original idea of the book was yours. I came into the story much later. So of course, I'm, so many of your readers and I too am so impressed by the versatility of your writing. Uh, from Paro to so many other books to things to leave behind. From, in this case, from a fictionalized history we moved to a fictionalized biography. So what was the incentive, motivation, or the imaginative vision when you decided to pick up Michael Madhusudan Dutt? Well, I think uh, if you want it in just one sentence, uh, I was an outsider writing about another outsider. We <laughs> were both outsiders. But I had a bit of an imposter syndrome because I know there are a few very worthy Bengalis here but Bengalis don't like other people treading on their territory. None of us do. But uh, a sacred cult figure like uh, Michael Madhusudan Dutt, with somebody who is so bad at languages that <laughs> it would have been a travesty. So then to have Madhusudan come up with the same idea by synchronicity, she had also been reading about Michael Madhusudan Dutt. She was also looking at it. And so we, we worked on it together. And uh, it, the, there's a magical way I have of working with Malashi. She is efficient, as all of you know. She is very, very organized. She's also very intuitive and very kind. So if anybody who thought we've done three books, we do so many things, but we, a five minute call on the phone somewhere with a bad connection is enough to keep us going. <laughs> we, we just manage. And, and so the book came around, and so she was my, so she said she is not an authentic Bengali either. Ranjana, do you think she is an authentic Bengali? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, the advantage we had with this book uh, was uh, this idea of Namitas that we should focus on the letters of Michael Madhusudan Das. Those letters are written in English. So we didn't have to deal with the problems of translation and uh, we could work on more the uh, colonial period clash between the English education of Michael Madhusudan Dutt in Hindu College, Calcutta and the great impact of that literature curriculum. Plus his love of in everything English. Then becoming a Christian as a very young man this desire to go and live in Albion shores, that kind of romanticizing of English and England on one hand, and the actual encounter of uh, not being recognized as an English writer and being told by Bethune to go and please write in your own language, which is Bangla. Those were some of the things perhaps that Navita uh, and I were attracted towards. Then the body of the uh, play is actually Michael Madhusudan Dutt's letters. Would you say the letters were important, but it took us nine years to put this book together and ask us why? Because although we selected the letters and knew they were important in tracking the history of Michael Madhusudan Dutt's creative journey and the uh, colonial, post-colonial kind of <coughs> argument that was in our own head, it took us almost a ninth year to find the vehicle by which the struggles of Michael Madhusudan Dutt could actually be put on stage. So it now it was, uh, no, it took us nine years and the pandemic. That's what <laughs> So go ahead and tell them the story of the No, no, I was, I was coming to exactly that. So what actually solved the riddle for us in the ninth year and the pandemic? So, um, you know, structure is everything in a 
play. I don't really understand plays. I wrote last book a very amateur play when I was in school. I still remember the story, but I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mala is also not in the play that I know of. Uh, but I knew that there's a structure within these. Um, so it all, the letters almost automatically fell into five acts in the highs and lows, ebbs and tides of his life. And they were in his own voice. So that impersonator, imposter syndrome could be dealt with. He was speaking. All we had to do was put those letters together. But still it was flat. His language was archaic. It, it didn't reach across. People couldn't understand what he was saying. Even his sarcasm was lost. It, it, it was different. Then my friend Pragya Tiwari came up with a very good idea when she read it. She, she was keen to read it because she had grown up in Canada and she knew a bit about Michael Madhusudanta, quite a lot actually. And she didn't begrudge uh, uh, Fahari writing about <laughs> it. So she said, what you need, we, I had, um, what was our man called? The, the Sutradhar. We had a Sutradhar. We had a Bengali Babu with a Sutradhar. And she said, this doesn't work. So instead, she came up with this very good idea that she said, have a young research student who can question everything about him. Because earlier, Mala had said, let's get a woman sutradhar. And I said, no woman sutradhar will tolerate Michael Madhusudanta. No modern woman had said, what the hell, this man should be lynched or something. You know? So that will be the novel. So then she said, have a woman researcher. So we had to rewrite a lot. And here I did very badly. I told Mala, I said, Mala, I'm very caught up. I'm not aware that this is and that. You have to rewrite this. You have to make this Bengali into a, a, what do you say, into a rebellious, a very fiery sort of a, trans, a, a, a researcher. And she has to live in Bangladesh. So I said, you know all about this, you are a, a, a professor, I mean, you know about this, and you've been to Bangladesh. She is very patient, she said, I don't know if I can do it, I said, go on, do it, do it, do it. And I hustled her, and she did it. She just sat down and wrote that whole part out. So everywhere it was scratch out, Bengali guy, to remove his dhoti, he's wearing a sari, he's got a bindi, he just rewrote. It takes a lot to rewrite a lot of uh, key things. But Mala did this and then on the phone, because this was on the lockdown, we would uh, schedule three hour, two hour phone calls. Three to five, I think it used to be. She'd say, I want to take a nap. So, 3.15, 3.30 to five. It was a time when our conversation time, when our other conversation time, when we would go through the dialogue and I would scratch out and tell her what I thought was reading a bit not like a spoken word. So we would go through it again and again and again and rewrite every bit of what that young woman did. And then Odayan and Hakukala also put in very thoughtful changes and so many. So it came, but that rewriting and watching this character emerge <laughs> right from her name. So that was fun. And uh, we are hoping that, uh, looking at you, I'm just saying, oh no, this is some other language. <laughs> Translations are waiting. Okay, so that is my answer. It's uh, quite delightful to recall those afternoon phone calls during the pandemic. But honestly, this woman who's called Rubina Rahman, this young PhD researcher whose research subject is Michael Madhusudanda literally emerged during one of those conversations. Now, I'm basically an academic and not a creative writer, but I have lots of friends who are creative writers. And they would all say, you know, characters just happen. And once they arrive on the page, they have a life of their own. And I would say, yes, yes. But there was a part of me which never believed it. I said, it was not possible you to create a little detail. But I really experienced this miracle that Rubina Rahman, including the name, simply walked into the page one afternoon. So here is Michael Madhusudan who is the innovator of at least three things in the Bengali.
early literature, say the area of the mid 19th century, gained the track of writing in that uh, language, the epic form. And he borrowed from Milton in certain ways, but he created it, and that famous epic Meghna called Kabu was the outcome. He also created the sonnet form because he was so uh, inspired by the Petrarchal sonnet patterns in European languages of which he knew several. And he started writing sonnets in Bangla. And he wrote about uh, areas of his childhood which were in Bangladesh, Shagurzori and all that area. He also brought the blank form from, uh, from British uh, writing into Bengali writing. So he was an innovator of our excellence. But there was always, as Navita said, this nagging problem that I had that he is very anti-woman. And why did I say that? Because he had one wife by the name of Rebecca Thompson, four children whom he abandoned in uh, Madras and we never hear about them afterwards. No researcher has been able to find any evidence of an honorable divorce. But he found another woman of French extraction and she was his life partner and they had a few children too. She stayed with him to the end of his life. She died actually three days before Michael did. So here was this literary genius on one hand and in his personal life rather a dreadful man. So, and, and this is a struggle. Namita quite rightly said, I have seen this happening in my own research subject which was Henry James. And I've seen this happen with my students who are working on Ernest Hemingway, Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. uh, D.H. Lawrence. I mean, all of them were gifted writers, but what do you do about difficult situations that they create in their own lives? So let me just read a two minute or three minute extract where Rubina Nyaman faces this dilemma and Damita and I try to put it into her words. So, uh, You've got the book out there, so this is page 36. So this is the Sutsadha. Michael was a pampered only child, the heir to his father's fortune and vast estate. Had he cut all connections from his parents, etc. And then she talks, uh, uh, she talks about these two women. And then says, I am no longer a neutral researcher. I confess to having lost the academic distance necessary for a scholarly project. I'm literally boiling with rage at our hero's convenient double standards, at his hypocrisy, his selfishness, literary brilliance, overweening ambition. These things didn't give him the right to destroy so many lives. Tortured genius. Let me flag that these tortured genius types are always men. <laughs> Somehow, yeah. 
But uh, Michael Madhusudan that comes into a very long passage here. So that's how books sort of uh, bleed into each other, I guess. Thank you for remembering that. Well, let's move then to the third book, uh, The Blind Matriarch. And as you, Namita, rightly say that books move one into the other. Uh, there are certain themes which carry on, and one of them is your interest and mine too, in folklore and deepers as well, folklore and mythology. So when you worked on The Blind Matriarch and created this figure, uh, Matangi, uh, who was just a very powerful character in this novel, and she's blind, and obviously one thinks of other uh, blind people who are in a way clairvoyant and creative in a strange kind of a way. Uh, and this is intricately woven into the fabric of the novel. Do you want to say how this novel came to you during pandemic times and was actually written quite rapidly, wasn't it? Yes, we were all sitting quietly at home. I was working on the novel which I had begun a little while ago. Sorry. I had begun this novel before the pandemic. But then the pandemic gave us the lockdown, the first lockdown gave so much time to all of us uh, to, to pursue things which, because daily life took up less time. And uh, this character of a blind old woman who was in my heart and mind just entered the page and I wrote this in real time. So every day I would write a longish bit and it would cover what has happened in the last two, three or four days. And, and that's how the whole book just came about. In its own, uh, it was as though I was telling myself the story. And it had that quality of folklore. Yeah, I think that was the feeling I got, you know, when I was reading the book, that it was actually as if you were living the book while you were. I was. It, it was uh, not a plan and a structure. I would sit down, I would write a few chapters, I had a vague idea where it would go. I would send them to my editor. My editor would also sit at home during the lockdown. So she would very kindly read it and almost always say, it's little things, but that first edit at an early stage is a very precious thing. And, and before you knew it, the book was out. But then it, they said it would take at least an hour, or one year or one and a half years to publish it because the publishing cycle had closed down during the pandemic. So when, I, when it came out, I said, who on earth will want to read this book? It's an old woman, a nine-year-old woman making laddus. That was the big high point of the book. Nothing much happened in it. But the stories were very quiet. And then this beautiful cover happened. I have to tell all of you that this cover, which is so stunning, is actually a piece of embroidery that the uh, artist at Penguin, uh, El Amad Gunjal, commissioned a friend of his to do embroidery. So this uh, young woman has actually embroidered her poses. So uh, these little dimensions came into the book and these little stories, dimensions, quirks in a book make it what it is. And yeah, it's done all right. And uh, yeah, I hope some of you will sit and read it sometime. It's a fascinating intergenerational story. You know, these families live in different apartments in the same block. And uh, it's so real at one level, the interactions that happen among sons and daughters-in-law and older people. But the, this, this scroll, the cover page, I mean, this woman who is blind has amazing intuitions. And the birds speak to her, and the flowers speak to her. And this whole idea of seeing and yet not seeing, seeing and perception, uh, that struck me as very important to the development of the story. But Deepa, what about you? What are some of the key things in the book that struck you? First of all, uh, the intuition that Matamima has. And the book is so heavy. It's full of sensory details. You know, yes. all the time it's either she it's touch or smell or, you know, it's like a blind, blind person negotiating the world. And the second thing is the connections. You know, uh, in the beginning you have a, uh, I said you talk about the trees in the park, all the roots are intertwining beneath the earth. And I think, you know, the relationships come across like that. You know, the numerous relationships and each and every character has their own story which is completely narrated because their voices are all 
So that is a remarkable thing to put off in a book. I have read somewhere uh, that just like you have the worldwide web, you have the worldwide books, www, and the, the connection, the trees connect deeply through their roots. They talk to each other. They have intuitive uh, understanding. They convey messages. They speak. And if a tree is transplanted, it is actually traumatized. And if a tree is living alone in a concrete pot, it, it is, uh, it can go psychotic. So it's rather like that with human beings also. It's a non-verbal communication. I mean, if we live only in Zoom calls, we might all go crazy. But if, even in our joint family during pandemic, if people are able to get a sense of each other's anger, displeasure, laughter, Saves them from because so I think that is what you are talking about. Thank you, thank you. 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 Well, whichever, whatever you want, really, you want to express yourself. Yes, please go ahead. We'll keep it all brief and quick so that lots of people get yeah, the yeah. opportunity. Uh, please go introduce yourself because the session is being recorded. I'm, I'm Gopi Jha. Uh, my small queries regarding both of us who are sitting here. Another two books. Yeah. I have In Search of Sita and Finding Rada. I personally books two times or three times. So, first uh, query is regarding your introduction, Mantaji's introduction in this book. Uh, I have found last days of Radha in not so many books uh, like Gar Samhita and some books. You have concluded your introduction with the last days of Radha and when Krishna uh, broke his view and threw away and he, he never played again. The Radha so merged into Krishna. <coughs> Very touchy and by imagination ran into different directions. I started finding the original source of this uh, story and you have mentioned that long now forgotten book you have read earlier. So as a secondary source this is uh, good for me. But I'm in search of primary sir. Have you ever uh, remembered the name of the book? I, I also found uh, the story on the net. But again, that did not give a source to it. And somebody, I'm forgetting who had mentioned the source, but as I said, this is a, not an academic book. This is a yeah. book of intuitions. Yeah. So if, I, if you ever find the source, you let me know. If I do, I also read it. It was. It was. It is. But I found in the course of this so many other books on my uh, records, which I can't remember her name now. She gave me a copy of her book, Father's Book, which was out of print, which was about a, a beautiful story written in Hindi, a novel almost, of when Radha goes to meet Krishna in the battlefield and they encounter in courtship. So it's about Radha in Yeah, I have also read somewhere that in the night Radha came in the battlefield yes. and made Krishna. So these things then the course of war changed. They are part of our collective imagination. Yeah. Uh, may I ask uh, again? I, I think let's go on to a few more and this time so no, no, no. anyone else? Uh, the blind patriarch was to title. Could you please tell us about this whole process of translation? How do you collaborate with the translator and who questioned the book and how did it all come about? Because it was very powerful. See, everything in my life is uh, luck by chance in this thing. Uh, serendipity? Yes. Yes, serendipity, <laughs> luck by chance. So I, um, long ago, Rajkumar had asked uh, Mr. Prabhat Ranjan to do some sample translations. And I read them and I felt that his translation conveyed the simplicity of the language and the story. So I was chatting with him, would he like to do the whole book? 
He said yes, but he said he is totally puzzled by what you call it. Because the word andha in Hindi is a very bold word. I mean, what would you say? Yes. To call her andhi would be a insult. Because blind has a little fuzzy edges. So uh, I said, he was saying, kya kare? I said, no, we can just call it matangi ma if you like. And he said, okay. And then that day itself, half an hour later, he phoned very excited. He said, Mujhe it raya ki, why not call it Gandhari? And I immediately said, yes. Because uh, Gandhari, yes. the whole essence, yes. but yes. without yes. mentioning Gandhari. Yes. And Gandhari is, is so much more, more strong, pitiable. So that is the joy of translation. I'm often, when I write in English, and the book is translated to Hindi, I feel it's a lot of garbhat really. It belongs to the language where it belongs. It belongs. Yes. My um, Shakuntala belonged to the Marathi translation. It belonged to the Hindi translation. And here also. Also, things to be found. Things That also was Pushpesh's beautiful translation. And there it was one more thing that Pushpesh knew Kumau much better than I did. So his translation had a lot of depth. But there I must claim credit. I told him Ms. Kanao, again I am excited for the call. Let's call it Rath Pahari. <laughs> <laughs> now we are ready for the translation of the yes. trade Bible. Yes. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Any other questions? Um, I, 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 I can I see that you have eyes to get my hands on. Yes, I, I, I know. I am the disability in literature. Yes. I am thinking of movies like Sparsh, Centre for Women, while we talk about the time. And now we know that blind we have to say visually challenged. Yes. So we have to physically correct. I'm trying to get my hands on into the book. And I'm thinking of a wonderful conference that Professor Anil Amita had organized on disability and literature. Do you remember that one? Yes. A two-day international conference. And the range of challenged people in the right papers. Two separate people from um, societies that work with disability were in touch with me, saying that they deeply appreciated the book. And uh, they did not find the use of the blind meter here, uh, because they saw that it's a novel. They did not find the title difficult. They could handle it. They, I mean, obviously, it could make a visually a fair But Andhari had that effect. But uh, I really do think that we, uh, as, a, as a nation, as a culture, we are often very insensitive to um, disability. Oh, yes. uh, and uh, I, this book, there were so many people who came back to me saying they had people who had a disability in their family and not they could not. Oh, Paramita, please. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't have any question for her. But I uh, make a small comment. <coughs> you know, I am a diehard fan of Namita's work. I got introduced to her work through this book, uh, Things to Leave Behind, maybe four years back. And I was amazed the kind of uh, stretch of imagination, the kind of words, the language, and the landscape uh, she has used. And uh, I told her that this book will go places. And uh, maybe a side that it is one of the places that she has done. <laughs> Will go many places in had one also. And you know, I uh, see a uh, kind of a picturesque uh, situation where even at that point of time I could imagine and could visualize the Nenita Lake and what is all happening uh, around it. And as Deepa said, Mala said that so many folk, folklores and folk tales uh, intertwined with the main theme. And uh, it was very I just unput down my novel and I kept reading it and have uh, suggested to so many friends of mine to uh, read that book. And I, it's one of my very, uh, I mean, uh, I'm very fond of this book. I've been telling you wherever we, wherever we meet. Thank you so much. And there's a Uriya edition. Yeah, I know how yeah, now. Yeah, I'm writing a, I know you're writing a blur, but I was very hope because the Uriya translation was by uh, Mother Chirushri. Yes, yes. And her daughter is a very beautiful painter. And so we talked about him. Yes. And I sent her some images and she played around with them and she has done a very uh, beautiful cover. Yes. She has shared that with me. But I think 
here I have to pay credit, I have to pay tribute to Shivani Ji. Because uh, it was Shivani Gaurakant and her 52 novels and books out of which I don't know how many of them, but the majority of them were about Kumau and the mountains. That made people from across the Hindi speaking world, across the English Hindi, uh, uh, English Indian world and across Bangla, Gujarati, so they, just, uh, they related to her stories and so they related to the landscape. And uh, so many times I met people who said, we know about Kumau because we read Shivani Ji. Yes. Yes. She brought, yes, her stories brought the heart of Kumau. And for me, the heart of Kumau is stubborn with it. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a problem for me now. You see now, all the women that so all the stubborn women people have already met them in uh, Shivani Ji's books. And I will take one more minute to finish the presentation with I can't do without that because I just finished uh, Time Matter. I got it from Jaipur Fest and just finished it. And I'm amazed with the, you know, it's basically like any other daily house, you know, four story uh, building on the whole Punjabi or what they are, whatever they are, the whole family is living in one of the uh, flat. And it's a very strange, uncanny way this lady, Madam Gima, has those parts, you know, like you see, finds the barbet um, being hurt somewhere and then um, tells uh, the daughter in law that we'll be doing this. And one good thing about her was that uh, she, as she said, that she loves Indian literature. And uh, wherever, in all her books, there are some mentions of the nuances of her own uh, literature. And she has traced her imagination from Keats, um, Shelley, and Shakespeare to Dinkar and Dharmi uh, Party uh, also. I just finished the book. And very amazing. I mean, um, so one year of uh, pandemic, I think, 20, 2021, uh, that uh, second place. It's been very nice. Yeah, it's been very good. Day. Thank you, Dinkar ji. I discovered by writing it yeah, more and more. Yes, so, yes. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Namita and Deepa. And thank you, Sanitya Academy, for giving me an opportunity to be in conversation for this session. Indeed, we are all great admirers of Namita Gokhale's writing. And uh, as this session has shown, there is this amazing diversity and scope. And yet there are certain strands of deep local knowledge which also transmits into a more uh, across the cultures, across the languages, across the nation kind of a platform, which is why Namita's books translate very easily. And Namita, I do believe that you know lots of Hindi and other languages too. You just would let on all the details because of fluidity and, and uh, the, 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 the uh, ease and uh, felicity with which you quote from different sources certainly reveals how much you know of those languages and their literatures. So indeed your work is a celebration of the multilingual aspects of India and the Science Academy is the perfect platform for presenting your material. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful audience. We look forward to meet you here again.